Well, welcome to another unboxing. And you'll notice my new sign that I have just over there in the corner. Yeah. Not only do we learn things here, but I try to bring a lot of fun, which all of you tell me you really, really appreciate, to the classroom. When you have fun, you learn better, right? So I came across this sign and I thought, how perfect. Playroom, enter at your own risk. It describes the workshop to a T. It really does. So let's get this class going. And let's see what's inside of this box. And you can see right away, His Majesty the King is present. So it tells you that in all likelihood, we are going to be unveiling none other than a Swedish beauty. And I am hoping the best for this Swedish beauty because when you look at this box, oh my goodness gravy, is this a junky box that this machine was shipped in. I'm not gonna say it any other way. It is junk. I don't know if it's one of those boxes that they shipped toilet paper in originally from China or what, but I'll tell you one thing, it is a mess. Let me move His Majesty back to a safe place and we'll take a look at this box to begin with because when I saw this box end up on the front steps of the workshop, I thought, holy mackerel. Whatever's inside, it better have the vintage sewing machine fairies with it because otherwise, we are toast. We are toast, we really are. So let me turn this around real quick. We'll turn it to the obvious side of concern right here. And I'll bring the camera down so you can look at that a little bit closer. And this is literally what I saw. I mean, apart from the box just being junky, you can see that straight away. It's split down the side here. And when you do just a light pull on it, all of a sudden, you can see that they used a purple pad for packing. Pur purple pad for packing. More alliteration. I always get alliteration in these live premieres, and it's like, my tongue is tied, I can't say that. But I just did somehow. Purple pad for packing. It's a pretty purple pad for packing. All right, who else has a P that they want to add to that? It's a pretty purple pad for packing, but did it protect? Yeah, that's all I've got. All right, if you've got more posted in the chat, other P's that you would build into that little sentence of, I wonder what we're going to find inside when we look at seeing the packing materials oozing, oozing and bruising from the side of the package. Holy mackerel. And just as you go around the entire box, it's nothing to write home about. It's just horrible. Again, I've said it before, the outside shell that you use for packing, look at here. This box that they decided to use, which they should never have used, it must have had a compromise already before they even ship, because here they're taping a little patch over the outside of the box. But it does say, thank you for using Priority Mail, but this came by FedEx, so I guess they went to the post office, stole some packing materials, cut it up, patched their box, and then called FedEx and said, we know it's a crappy box, but will you take it anyway? And they're like, yeah, we're desperate for business. Sure. And they took it. <laughs> well, look at this thing. Oh my gosh, it's like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. My workbench is level. If I come out on the shot, I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's like buckled to the side, kind of like the box had a stroke and it's like leaning to the side and it's like, uh, I don't know, I don't know what my job is because it's not to really, and here it's bulging out from this side. Yeah, you can see that in the shot. There, it's bulging out. And now we're back to disaster side where we can reach in and literally touch the machine that's inside of there. It's torn up so badly. I mean, this is cheap. Look at this, two fingers. 
and I'm not a superhero, although some of you think I am. Finger, thumb, two fingers, two digits. Yeah, you get the idea. Somebody picked the, maybe they, I don't know, maybe they ran an advertisement and said, we want the worst box possible so that Scott can go into one of his ridiculous rants at the workshop when it arrives. Well, congratulations. Wherever you source this box, if, actually I have your address. This thing came all the way from Medford, Oregon. Medford, Oregon. And I will send them a certificate for the crappiest box in the history of the workshop. And uh, while we do have fun in our playroom, we're also real serious about protecting our vintage treasures, aren't we? And this shipper, wow, wow, wow. Looks like Alejandro, Alejandro sent it. Alejandro from Oregon. Alejandro, you will get a certificate in the mail for the worst box possible. The worst box possible for sure, my friend. All right. Well, let's continue with some reggae style music as we start to get into this unboxing. The first one was called She No Dull Beat. The next one is called Revenge Body Beat. Revenge Body Beat. Hey, you guys, come on. We got to get to work. What do you mean this is work? I don't think this is working. Okay, all right, it's a little bit of work. Herr Obermeister, do one of your turns. I love when you do your turn. Ha ha ha, yeah! All right, guys, let's get to work. Come on, seriously. Seriously, we got to get to work. Come on, you guys. Come on, come on, come on. For the crappiest box in the history of the channel. Blade really, really short because I'm concerned with as poor as the corrugation is on this box that it's just going to go right through the thing. Ooh, and it's like alive. It's alive. It sprung to life. You come out on this shot a little bit and you can see that pad. Crummy box, but a great pad. Yeah, that's super thick. Let me check the thickness on that. Almost, uh, almost three inch pad. So that's pretty impressive. And it looks like on most of the sides of it, they use the same type of pad. Uh, if they had picked a really good quality box, they would be on my good list right now. But if they're considered to be in the classroom, which they are, they're right around a C minus or a D right about now based on the box, that's for sure. Nice pad though. Okay, I'll give them a C because they used a good pad. Well, they used a good pad on most of the sides. Here they used, it looks like pool noodles that they stuck near the handle of the case. So not a bad pad, but not as good as that purple one, that's for sure. And they did not uh, stretch wrap or pad the case on the inside at all, which I would definitely recommend. Just because you put a machine inside of a case doesn't mean that it's going to have adequate protection 
to protect that case. The case has value too, right? Especially a case like this. So let me open up the front of this box and we will continue unveiling. I don't even think I need the knife. I don't even think I need the knife. I'm just going to... Yeah. There you go. And there was a hole in this box and they they took a, a priority box from uh, the uh, Postal Service. See that? Oh my gosh. Alejandro. Alejandro out of Oregon. What are you thinking, man? What are you thinking? And then you ship, you didn't even ship it at USPS after you took their packing materials, for goodness sakes. You ended up going with FedEx after that. That's just, I'm going to turn you in, buddy. I'm going to report you to the USPS box protecting squad, if there's such a thing. The USPS PX box protecting squad. Yep, you're, you're, you're done, man. But there's a good pad on the bottom as well for this case. You can see again about a three inch pad. They had padding over here, padding around there, and then the noodles on the other side. So crummy box, but uh, the choice of padding is, uh, is pretty impressive. So let's get this box out. All right. So yeah, I mean, all in all, the let me, I can't see the screens the wrong way. The padding is impressive. And how much more effort would it have taken to get a, uh, a good quality box with adequate corrugation and a box that hopefully did not have built-in ventilation that they didn't have to steal packing materials from the USPS store and then ship at FedEx. Oh, people, 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 people. Pumpkin eater or something like that. Purple pumpkin eater. That's not it. You know what that phrase actually is? Type it in the chat. I'm just making it up. Ah. So let's take a look at what is inside of this case. I think we pretty much know, don't we? You guys are super smart in the classroom. You know what kind of case this is. And uh, you probably have suspicions as to what is inside. If you do, type it in the chat. Type it in the chat so that... Uh, you can try to guess the make and model. We already know the make based on the case, unless unless I got totally something weird shipped in this type of case. You know what I mean? So the last one was called uh, Revenge Body Beat. The next one is called Ice Kanky Beat. Ice Kanky Beat, I think is what it says. And these are all reggae. I decided to go reggae today on you. Especially in view of my new sign, the playroom, enter at your own risk. That just has the freedom of reggae, doesn't it? All right, let's see if there's any padding on the inside of this case. Again, if you ship this way, let's say you decide to ship your Swedish beauty to the workshop. When I open this case, there should be padding in there to immobilize that machine so that it's not being jostled around. If you don't immobilize it, then trust me, uh, it's going to get banged around in that case pretty good. You you read, hopefully, Hans's uh, post recently. Uh, it dated back uh, on, a, on a basically a scientific research project that was done relating to shipping. And they tested all kinds of things, and they, they discovered the G-forces alone, that's something that's shipped through uh, a courier from, like, coast to coast. I mean, it's like going to outer space and going through a rocket launch how these things are banged around and shaken and dropped and everything else. So uh, we, we want to pack as if the worst possible scenario is going to become reality. So let's see how this packer, and I don't have much confidence at this point in Alejandro, who right now on the curve is getting a C in this classroom based on his choice of boxings. I don't, I'm guessing he probably didn't do any padding of this machine at all. Let's see. All right, take a deep breath with me. Oh, please, 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 please. And there's no padding. No padding. Let this be an example right now. And I'm gonna ring the bell again to signify this is an example of how you do not want to pad your Swedish beauty in the case if you're shipping it to the workshop. 
or if you're buying one, the person that's shipping it to you, they better do a better job than this. Seriously. The other quick tip for you is you may notice in the shot that the extension bed is facing the machine. As you close this case, it's facing the machine. And even though the knobs are plastic, they have a metal bolt in the middle of them. Most of them do, like this needle position one. And look at what can happen to the bed if you decide not to face it the other way and or put a pad in there. Look at the scratching on that. Can you see that in the shot? I think you can. So a tip, if you're gonna ship one of these, don't ship it with it facing this way. Ship it facing this way and preferably you're gonna do some sort of stretch wrap or something like that around this machine so that if this is having incidental contact with it, it's not gonna damage one of these knobs if it takes a big hit or it's not gonna scratch uh, the plastic surface of these knobs either. You always wanna have a buffer, otherwise you get something like this. So I'm gonna put it back in the case properly and that's the way you wanna ship it like that with some sort of a buffer, okay? All right, let's get this machine out and take a closer look at it. And I've actually had people that didn't know, and this is not to insult anyone's intelligence. That's never the goal in this classroom. There's always, uh, any question can be asked. It's not a dumb question. Uh, and I like to highlight things that a lot of us take for granted that already know. But at some point, we didn't know. You know what I mean? So in most of these Husqvarna cases, you're going to have an upper chamber right here where the foot controller can fit. And then down below is going to be the accessory box that would be traditional to Husqvarna type attachments. That goes in the bottom little chamber there. And then most of them, some of them have gotten ripped off over the years, but there's a strap that snaps to the top of this that then holds that foot controller and accessory box in place so that they don't potentially get dislodged if they're being shipped. So really a thoughtful design on the part of the Swedish uh, in trying to set up a case that is real self-sufficient and, and self-contained so that uh, you don't have to carry you know an extra bag or something like that for your foot controller. It's got all those goodies uh, and all the space allotted to put your machine in there and to have it uh, shipped in a, in a positive way or to take to a quilting class or a quilting retreat or whatever. I'm gonna come on in this shot a little bit. So you can see all in all the case is in good shape, the latches work. Uh, yeah, yeah, decent, a decent case and an, and an original case as well. Uh, really incredible design on these as well. I love, I love the way the Swedish think when it comes to designing things. And I haven't even told you yet, I don't think I have. What's the story behind this machine that we are now getting a glimpse of? Well, I get requests all the time for all types of machines. And oftentimes I'm able to go into my personal collection and uh, get one of those machines out, take it through my finalization process, and then premiere it for that customer that requested that type of machine. Uh, in many cases recently, I have not had enough Swedish beauties for the demand of requests coming in. So I've been trying to use my different channels, collector friends and other trusted resources to find original owner Swedish beauties. And that's why this machine is here. I found, uh, well, I actually have a collector friend that's out in Oregon and he pointed me towards this gentleman, Alejandro, uh, that was looking to sell this machine it was bought original by his, his grandmother or mother I don't recall I think it was his mother bought it original brand new back in the 50s and it's been in the family the entire life of the machine and he decided that he wanted to downsize and get rid of it so this collector friend heard about it 
and said, hey, you're always looking for Swedish beauties. I said, yeah. He goes, I've got a real, it sounds like I, I've got a real good one that this gentleman contacted me about. I'm not interested in it. Are you interested? I said, yeah, absolutely. Duh. So uh, I got in contact with this gentleman, took him through my litany of 80 questions, which he interrupted several times, like, you really need to ask all of this? I said, yeah, I do. And then finally we got to the finish line and said, okay, I'll go ahead and buy it. I'll go ahead and buy it because I've got customers asking about this particular machine all the time. All the time. So uh, this is why it's here. You like that little dramatic pause, like I'm trying to gather my thoughts, and I'm like, yeah, this is why it's here. So let's do this. I'm going to put on a little bit more music. We'll come off the tripod, get a little bit closer, kind of look at this Swedish beauty up close and personal, and uh, then we'll continue moving forward. So the next one is going to be called Savannah Sunshine. Savannah Sunshine. <laughs> And if you were wondering, yeah, I got my pink glasses on. <laughs> I think it was, I think it was Emma that said she was shocked. Emma is a person that follows me on YouTube and a uh, great lady. And she said, I'm surprised that you can wear pink or that you're wearing pink or something. And it's like, yeah, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable enough in my skin. I can put on pink and still feel like a man. Yeah, I can. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Now, if you're one of the many men watching this channel and you have this great reluctance to wear pink or to have something pink on, get over it, man. You're a real man even when you wear pink. And if you send me a picture of you wearing something pink, guess what? I'll post it on Facebook. I will. All right, let me cut the music real quick. I'm just cutting the music so we can talk through a couple things real quick. Because um, I've done this in a couple of other recent premieres, and someone said it was very, very helpful. And these are some folks that have been sewing forever, and they can still learn something new. So I think that's way cool. So this is obviously the bobbin case for this Husqvarna. And I still haven't told you what model is yet, because I figured you could throw some guesses out there, and I'm not looking at the chat. But as you're looking at this bobbin case, what, first of all, is the purpose of the bobbin case? What does it do in relation to the stitch output? All right, I'm not looking at the chat, but if someone typed in the chat, it helps define the top stitch. It's basically, as it's in the raceway area, it's pulling down on that thread as it's fed up and it's going through the sewing cycle, and it's pulling down to define that top stitch, then you're absolutely right. You get an A in the class today if that's what you typed in the chat. And if you knew it and didn't type it in the chat, you get a C because you're not participating. And you know that participating in the classroom, even though... We have a playroom type of environment. We're real serious about learning here, right? Sort of serious, yeah. So this little gadget here called the bobbin case helps define that lock stitch, or excuse me, the top stitch. It, it defines the top stitch. A lot of people think it locks, it defines the lock stitch because it's on the bottom, but it doesn't, it does the opposite. So as we're looking at these two screws, the one on the left is going to be the set screw that holds the band on, the pressure band that pushes against that thread with a certain amount of force in order to control how defined that top stitch is. If the screw on the right is turned clockwise too far, 
then you're going to be defining that top stitch too much and you're going to have to crank that upper tension up in order to countermand the over pull of the bobbin case. So again, as you turn this screw that's on the right in the shot, as you turn it clockwise, it's going to increase that pull to define the top stitch. So if you get a machine, and I'm just going to simulate, but if you get a machine and your upper tension is set all the way to max almost, and when you do a stitch off, you get a fairly decent stitch product, but let's face it, folks, it's all the way up almost on nine. That's about to the max. Then that usually will evidence the fact that that bobbin case tension is turned up too high. In other words, again, that screw on the right is turned too far clockwise. And someone, in order to get a balance of stitch, turned this way up to nine because this was pulling down so hard. So the simple solution, so you can get this back in a reasonable range, which on a Husqvarna is going to be right around somewhere between 5 to 6. But as soon as you turn it to 5 to 6 and leave this alone, your stitch is way out of whack. And as you look at that lock stitch, your lock stitch is going to look real wonky. It's not going to be defined. And it's because this is not pulling up hard enough in relation to how hard this is pulling down. It makes sense? So if we want to be in what's a reasonable range, somewhere between 5 to 6, then we need to turn that screw that's on the right counterclockwise. And you want to make adjustments on a bobbin case very, very slowly. Because the adjustments are dramatic, even with a little adjustment on that screw that's on the right. So you'll get an appropriate screwdriver, a smaller screwdriver, turn it about 1 to 2 millimeters. Do a sew off with this set where it's at now instead of up on almost nine. Okay, it's still, you're still not getting a well defined lock stitch. Then turn that screw that's on the right in the bobbin case, turn it about another two millimeters counterclockwise. Run another sew off. Okay, it's starting to look better. And we're all doing this hypothetically. It's starting to look better, but still not quite there. So we're going to leave this alone because that's about the range that we want to be in between five to six. So we're going to turn that screw that's on the right another two millimeters. You do another sew off. Oh my goodness gravy. We've hit pay dirt. The lock stitch looks phenomenal. The top stitch is still perfectly defined. We've hit that magical sweet spot. Okay. And that's what you want to aim for. You don't want to have to ratchet this all the way up to nine because this is pulling down too hard. You want to make subtle adjustments on this. And between each adjustment, you do a sew off so you can actually test to see what that stitch is looking like. And don't go between materials. If you're testing it on leather, continue to test it on leather until you get that sweet spot. Don't go from leather to cotton and then do some more sew offs and kind of bounce all over the place. And make sure that your needle is fresh. The thread is less critical, but make sure it's obviously not the original thread from the 1950s, either on the bobbin case or on top. You always want to make sure you start with fresh thread before you start fine-tuning the uh, tension and get that perfect balance, that sweet spot. So fresh thread, fresh needle, subtle adjustments on this if this is cranked all the way up to nine, and then finally you'll hit that sweet spot, okay? And obviously, with 126 steps that I'm going to take this machine through, there's a lot of other stuff that will get you to a perfect stitch and get that Swedish beauty sewing like a Swedish beauty. So don't think that these simple little tips are going to get you to pay dirt. It's going to get you close. It's going to get you better. But if you want that machine to run at the top of its game, pack it up better than you just saw Alejandro do and send it to the workshop and i will send back that swedish beauty running at a level that you've never even imagined of before seriously so let me set this to the side we went through our little mini class on uh, adjusting tension now a quick little tip again and i've shown this i think when i recently did the premiere on john smith's uh rather rough looking swedish beauty uh and i pointed out that with the 
with the design of the hook system on the Swedish Beauties, it's designed so that this is floating during the sewing process. It can move left and right. It can move up and down. See that? Goes about a, a millimeter or so either direction. And it does that through the constant sewing cycle. And the Swedish designed this again because they wanted to have, what is that over there? Hold on a second. They wanted to have Yeah, I got a little work ahead of me. That's okay. Um, they wanted to have a raceway area that would be virtually jam proof so that you could use heavier threads. You could do a number of different things in the sewing process. And this, because it has its floating capacity, left and right, up and down, it would be less inclined to jam. So if you have one of these or if you've acquired one of these and you're going, oh geez, something must be broken, it's designed to do that. It's called a jam-free raceway, and the Swedish were very proud of it when they developed the technology. And others since have tried to copy it to not as much success as the Swedish did. They just didn't. So kudos to the Swedish. They are super smart folks. They just are. So we're going to peek inside of the faceplate now, and if you watch the recent premiere on John Smith's Type 21, you remember that when I went through it and showed you different things, on the inside of the faceplate, his faceplate was not stamped with Husqvarna Sweden and the Royal Crest. Some faceplates are, some faceplates are not. And uh, eventually, if you guess what model this is, you may see that it's a different model, and maybe that's why on this model, kind of like cars, they have different accessories and features for different models of cars or they have different classes of cars within that same model. And if you spend more money, you get more bells and whistles. Well, I don't think the Swedish are much different. Certain adornments like this, like stamping the plate, might be reserved for only certain models. So, there you go. Also, you'll notice as we look inside of the faceplate area on this machine, it's gonna look different than John's. All, all John's had was a dial like this that you either rotate to the rear to increase presser foot pressure or you rotate it to the front to decrease presser foot pressure. And again, the simple rule, and I say this all the time, yet I still get the question being sent to me by email, by phone, and otherwise. People just don't quite un understand it. The heavier the material, the thicker the gauge of the material, the more difficult it is for those feed dogs to move that material underneath that presser foot, the more pressure you need to bring to the equation. So thicker material, heavier material, more layers, more pressure. Rotate this to the rear. And on this particular model, it has what's called a quick release. All you do is push this tab in, and what's supposed to happen is it's supposed to release all pressure from the presser foot. Why would you need that? Type in the chat if you've got a hunch as to why you might need that or how it might be helpful, okay? I'll wait a little bit. You might be a slow typer, you never know. Matter of fact, I'll turn the music back on, I'll turn the volume down. So again, this one is called Savannah, Savannah Sunshine. What a pretty name, isn't it? That, that would almost be a good name for a person, don't you think, Savannah Sunshine? Maybe like a stage name, they're a performer, and now introducing on the main stage, Savannah Sunshine! <sighs> that was supposed to be applause. I, I, I know, Dr. Singer. I, I had four cups of coffee this morning. I'm just admitting it. I ended up not going on that trip to Tulsa, so I, I'm just drinking more coffee. I, I, I know you wrote that I'm not supposed to do that, but okay, whatever. I'm going to drink more coffee. I'm, I'm, I just am. I'm, I'm going to do it. Yes, you can frown as much as you want. I'm still going to drink coffee. So why would you potentially want to use a quick release like this? This little tab that has little teeth sticking out on it. You might be trying to stick something real thick underneath this presser foot 
And because this Swedish beauty does not have a hyperextension. See, if I reach back there and I push up, I'm getting nothing. I'm getting like nothing really. So you might say, I want to put this underneath there, but I just, I'm, I'm just a little bit more space would make such a difference. Just a little bit more space. Well, the Swedish thought of you, you push this tab. Notice how that just popped down. And with that in the down position, like it is right there, we have no presser foot pressure. What does that mean? That means I can grab this presser foot bar and I can do a little dance. I know, I've got incredible rhythm, don't I? But the point is you can gain, look at how much you gain. This is, this is where it is right now. And you, get, you just need a little bit more space to get that material underneath there. Watch this. We just gained probably about three to four millimeters. See that? And then once you get the material in place underneath there, whatever it might be, maybe it's something like this. Hold on a second. I'm dropping stuff all over the place. It's horrible. Blah, blah, blah. Maybe it's something like this. Maybe you're sewing some sort of upholstery material and you want to do, I don't know, you want to do four layers and it's just super tight to get it underneath there. It's like, ah, ah, I can't do it. Cliffhanger can't hold on. Well, then you just cheat a little bit, which is nearly impossible while you're holding a camera, but you lift this up and you slide that material into place. But now you have to return to having presser foot pressure. Otherwise, when you go to, if you just leave it like this, with this in the down position, when you go to sew, that material is just, just going to look at you and laugh. It's not going to go anywhere. Because right now, there's not enough pressure, presser foot pressure, even when I move it to the down position. See, it's in the down position now, but watch. See, it's kind of moving around. So then we have to grab this finger on top, thumb on the bottom, and if it's working correctly, because this has not gone through my finalization process yet, but what's supposed to happen is when you pinch it here and pinch it there, it's supposed to lock back in place and it's not doing it. This is really gummy. I can feel it. Aha! So there you go. So once this is stripped of all the junk and gunk and gook and mook and all that kind of stuff it will drop down beautifully like that for no presser foot pressure and it will lock in place beautifully every single time so that you can resume having presser foot pressure again and now if you were to check the difference that material is not moving at all because that pressure is pushing down on the material because we have this set properly does that make sense and also here, I'll just point out, here is our serial number, which a lot of people struggle when they're looking at a, a Swedish beauty for the first time. Let's say they acquire one or they inherit one or whatever. And they're like, okay, I've watched that guy from Wisconsin and he talks about the serial number being a critical way to date a machine potentially. And I've checked the front where they put them on singers, not there. I've checked the front underneath the bed not there i checked underneath the raceway area on the bottom like some of those machines have it it's not there where in the heck is the serial number where where in the heck is oh <gasps> there it is look mom so the swedish right where the take-up arm is going to go up and down up and down that's where you'll find your serial number for a swedish beauty and the Swedes did not do a stellar job of documenting manufacturing dates for their machines. They just didn't. But Hans, my friend, my moderator, my editor, my buddy from Norway, has begun the process of compiling through research the serial number sequences to try to help us date Swedish beauties 
better. And that's not available to the general public. It's something that he's doing privately as a project. But if you reach out to us through Facebook Messenger, Hans will probably see that message because he intercepts a lot of the messages that come from uh, people that are looking to understand their Swedish beauty better. As a matter of fact, we recently got a question from someone that was only about an hour away from Hans in Norway. It just shows you how far this channel reaches and the fact that they, they find us either on YouTube and then they eventually find the Facebook page or they find the Facebook page and then they eventually find the YouTube channel. So they cross-pollinate each other all the time in helping us to expand our classroom reach to help people all around the world. That's really cool. That's very, very cool. I love it. So again, you can reach out to us through Facebook Messenger and uh, Hans will uh, see if he can probably be of assistance to you if you provide him the serial number that's on the inside right here adjacent to the upper tension and where the take-up arm moves up and down on your machine. Okay, all right. I think that's about it for there. That's all I wanted to talk about there. Well, obviously, and I've talked about this, when you, when you send a Swedish Beauty to the workshop, and most of you have done an excellent job, you'll not only put it in a much better box than Alejandro did, but you'll also pad that machine inside of the case so that as that machine is getting jostled around and bounced around, remember Han's recent post? Uh, I think it was letter three that he posted where he talked about safeguarding machines. And he talked about a, an old project that was done a while back, probably like 10 years ago, where they did extensive testing on things being shipped. And they even found that the G-forces that uh, a package is, is a, you know, basically exposed to in being transported, say, from East Coast to West Coast, is just mind-blowing. It's like the equivalent of being launched into space. And uh, the whole point that Hans was making to reinforce what I've said as a clear message over and over again, and that is pack for disaster, is you've got to pack for disaster. Otherwise, even in a situation like this where the machine is being shipped from Oregon to Wisconsin, little things like this can happen. It's not supposed to look like that. And again, it was in the case with no padding. So now this thread guide has been bent all the way in. And the problem with that is this is a real thin gauge metal. And in all likelihood, when I try to bend this back, when I try to bend this back, what do you think is going to happen? Yep, it's going to snap off. It's going to snap right off. Because this, you know, you can bend something one way and you might be okay. But as soon as you try to bend it back, it breaks. It breaks. Have you ever had the old radios with the antennas that would come out the top? And that antenna would get bent over, and it, you maybe even had it as a kid, and you're like, well, I'll just bend it back. <laughs> Comes off. So this might be a loss. And these are, unfortunately, very hard to come up with. These are really hard to come up with, these thread guides. Very, very hard to come up with. So I'll do my best on that. Plus, you can see it, and this may have been from previous whatever, but you can see the finish is getting worn off as well, so... So, talking a little bit about this crest real quick, and this branding on the front of this machine. If you're new to this channel, uh, you'll hear it in other premieres that I introduce Swedish Beauties in. The whole deal behind the crest and kind of the crown appearance of this, the royal look of it, is that the Husqvarna sewing machine factory was founded by the decree of the King of Sweden. And that's why I'm constantly introducing my friend his Majesty the King, uh, because he played an incredible role in decreeing a drilling and grinding, grinding plant that started making musket barrels and a variety of other uh, goods, and then right around 1872 started making the first Husqvarna sewing machines. So that's why, if you ever see this, you can go, oh, that's really pretty. That looks like royal royalty. Well, it is. That's because the roots of this great company, Husqvarna, dates back to a time when that king made that decree. Apart from that decree, we may never have had Husqvarna's and uh, Vikings, Husqvarna Vikings. So, thank you, King. Thank you, Your Majesty. So, uh, also, if you're really new to this uh, channel or you're not familiar with Husqvarna's, <clears throat> we've got a, a variety of different control areas over here. 
Down here at the bottom, we've got our feed dog drop, which the feed dogs, they're fully engaged when it's at the 12 o'clock position like this. If you want to drop the feed dogs for freehand embroidery, or you can also use it as a cheater's method for getting a little bit more clearance underneath the presser foot in lieu of going into there and doing what I showed you before with a quick release, etc. You can drop the feed dogs temporarily, gain about one or two millimeters, slide that material into place, and then you would re-engage the feed dogs again. So you would rotate it like this down to the six o'clock position so you can get that material in, and then before you resume sewing, rotate it back up so that those feed dogs are fully engaged and they're going to move that material uh, underneath the presser foot. So right above that we've got stitch width. And stitch width, if you're sewing a straight stitch, you're going to be over on zero. And then you've got a range of one to four as far as your stitch width uh, for stitch output. Also you'll notice this funky little silver tab on top of here. And that's for marking stop and start points if you're doing a buttonhole on this machine. You push it down, you release it in order to stop and start that function. Right up here we've got stitch length. And the stitch length on these Swedish Beauties is probably one of the best that there is. Uh, you can go all the way down here, you can see, uh, I mean you can go all the way to zero, but you're not going to get any material movement, you're just going to get a ball of thread and a mess down in the throat plate area. But you can go all the way down here in this range for some of the decorative ornamental type stitches. Uh, somewhere between, you know, that little hash mark to the right of the zero and 0.5 is usually where I'll set for those decorative stitches. And then you can go all the way up to four, and on four you're going to be getting probably right around uh, five stitches per inch approximately. So five stitches per inch all the way on four, you go all the way down you're going to be down to the uh, basically the satin type sewing right here. Uh, very, very fine stitching down to about 30 stitches per inch. And again, you just don't want to go, you don't want to be ridiculous about it because then the material is not going to be moving and you're just going to create a mess. So I wouldn't recommend going to zero. Maybe like in this range, you can roll it depending on the type of material you have underneath the presser foot. But usually for most decorative ornamental stitches, you're going to, you're going to be right around here somewhere in that sweet spot kind of experiment with a little bit. And then for this button right here, you've got reverse. You just push it in for reverse sewing and then uh, release it when you want to resume forward again, sewing forward again. Over here we have a control that does a couple of things. It's going to allow you to access cams, or I should say it'll allow you to access the cam functions. You can see right now this little slider is on five. Now the consistent thing about the black cams that are in the in these green machines is they're going to have five stitches on every cam but in position five it's always going to be a zigzag and they set it up that way so that regardless of what cam you have in the machine you're always going to have access to that zigzag but more importantly that cam is going to define the parameters of the needle swing so if you're sewing a zigzag or a decorative stitch, that cam is also going to help define how far that needle is going to go left and right to clear that throat plate. If you don't have a cam in the machine, you can get an anomaly where all of a sudden that needle will hit your presser foot and or hit, it'll clear the presser foot, it'll hit the hook or it'll hit the bobbin case because it's swinging too wide. So the simple rule is if you've got a Swedish Beauty like this, Never, ever, 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 ever operate it unless there's a cam in the rear of the machine. Don't do it. Because you're very likely to roll the dice and you're either going to strike uh, the presser foot, which will cause scarring to it, the throat plate opening, which will cause scarring and cause that metal, which is real thin gauge, to actually get barbed and then start snagging thread and all kinds of other disastrous things. And in the worst possible scenario, and it's not likely... But if you're using a real heavy gauge needle, like a 110 or above, you could even damage the alignment of your needle bar too. So don't roll the dice. Always operate your green machine Swedish Beauty with a cam in the back of it. Please, please, please. Okay? So again, position five is zigzag on all of the cams. And then you can move it 
up through these different uh, phases from you know four to three to two to one and uh, depending on how your machine is set up because there even are nuances within the different green machines you might have to recycle it between each movement. In other words, if you sew a stitch in position one like it is right now, before you try to force this to go to position two, and if you've tried it in the past and it's like, doggone it, it's jammed, what's going on? You may have to do a reset on your stitch width to release that mechanism. So if you're, you're obviously going to be probably on four or somewhere in that range when you're using one of these cam functions, then go all the way to zero move your slider to the next position and then move it back to four or three or two or wherever you are in that stitch width but each time you cycle it so now I, I just did the stitch now I want to go to the next one cycle it to zero move it to the next phase rotate your stitch width back to four or three or two or wherever you have it okay it'll make your life a lot easier so if you've ever had problems where this just doesn't seem to move freely Try that little hack, and uh, I, t I touched the wrong one. Try that little hack, and you should get a lot easier movement of that slider between the different modes of stitch outputs for the cam, okay? And then also this functions as well for needle position. You move it to the left, the needle is going to move to the left. You move it to the right, the needle is going to move to the right. But that's only true, that's only true if you have this set at zero. Notice what happens when I try to do it and it's set uh, and it's set on four for stitch width and I try to move this needle position. Does the needle, does the needle bar move? And uh, nope. Nope. I now move this to zero. <gasps> Magic. We're center, left, right, huh, left, right. So if you have a Swedish beauty and thought, daggone it, that needle thing that that guy from Wisconsin talked about isn't working because he showed me that this is needle position and I'm turning it. I must have something broken. And then you take it to that less than honorable service center and they go, knowing what the issue is maybe they go oh yeah yeah you've got a do hangy whatchamacallit dingy dongy that's broken inside of there and that little wang doodle unless we fix it you're not going to get needle movement and you go to get lunch and you're gone for about an hour and while you're gone they're laughing and they go oh, ooh, we fixed it mrs smith 150 bucks yeah there are people like that out there i'm sorry to say so all right, what else did I want to talk about over here? I think I pretty much covered it all. Covered it all. And I am kneeling right now, and I'm going to need an orthopedic surgeon if I don't get off my knees. And I've shown this in other premieres as well, but the key to learning is sometimes going over the same thing multiple times, right? So let's talk about this area over here, too. And this next song doesn't have a very complimentary title, it's called Tubby, T-U-B-B-Y, Tubby. All right, I am going to kneel again, and one of you will have to come to the workshop and pick me up, possibly. So this area over here, apart from it being a great place to collect dirt, because as I've said in other premieres, the motor that is inside of this housing acts like a vacuum cleaner, and you can see that right there. Matter of fact, if I grab a Q-tip swab real quick. And put a secret chemical on it called spit. And we just swab the inside of that area real quick. And yes, this is on my list of one of the 126 things to do. To a Swedish beauty when it comes into the workshop. You can just see the filth that gets sucked in to that motor. Imagine what's inside of the motor. You know what I mean? That's why I take the motor apart and service it as well. Just as you saw me recently do uh, to John's machine while I was rewiring it and such.
But it just gives you an idea, dirt is not the friend of our vintage sewing machines. So, but the point in coming over here was not to show you the dirt, although that's cool too. It's to show you this little doodad over here. So number one, if you've got one of these, or if you're thinking about acquiring one, it's got a release on here, which is spring loaded as part of this entire bobbin winding assembly. And there's a little tab on the bottom of here that when you slide a bobbin on it, it depresses that tab. And through that simple little act of sliding the bobbin on, it disengages the clutch so that when the machine is uh, fired up, this turns over here, but there's no movement uh, down at the needle. And the other thing it has is it has what's called a slow gear. And I, again, realize I just unboxed this. I don't know if it's working correctly. John's was not working at all because someone had at some point taken it apart and put it back together incorrectly. And there were some other issues with it on top of that. But uh, his, when John tried to pull his out, I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't budge. It would not budge. John Smith I'm referring to from Florida. So hopefully this one pulls out. Let's see if it does. Very reluctantly it pulled out. Very stiff. But what happens when you pull that out is it then takes that motor from full power down to one-fifth. Even if you push that foot controller all the way down, you're only going to get one-fifth of the power that you would otherwise if that motor is fully engaged. And then when you're done doing the slow sewing, which again, Husqvarna and the Swedish people designed it as a tool so you would have greater control. When you pull it out like this, that needle really almost moves like real slow. It's kind of cool. We'll, we'll, sh we'll show you that. I'll show you that uh, when uh, we fire this machine up. But uh, when you want to resume sewing, all you do is push it back in. And then when you step on the foot controller, you'll hear a little click. And that's telling you that that uh, clutch is re-engaged. And then you have full power again. So get ready for it. Because this machine and most of the Swedish beauties, even when they're not optimized, they generally have quite a bit of grit. When they're optimized, you better put your seatbelt on, if you know what I mean. So this is really a cool feature. Number one, the, the automatic, uh, as the name would suggest, the automatic clutch disengagement and then the slow gear is just an incredible thing. And even John Smith down in Florida with his extensive experience working primarily with commercial machines aboard ship uh, in the Navy and working at NASA with commercial machines as well, he didn't even know about this. So it just tells you that sometimes some of you watching this will be like, yeah, we already heard this. We heard it again. We heard it again. We heard it again. Well, that's because the audience changes. There's different people watching different premieres and where they may not have seen it in a previous one they can see it in this one so i'm going to keep saying it whether you like it or not <laughs> all right so if you're one of those box closers <laughs> there you go all right so let's turn this around we'll look at the back of the machine now and i'm pleased in 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 spite of the really poor corrugated box that was used the padding made up for it by Apart from that bent thread guide up here, which might prove to be a real pain in the neck for me, uh, the casing and everything uh, is still intact. So we're about to go to that rear data plate right now, as you know. So this is your last chance to try to guess what that specific machine might well be that we're in the process of unveiling. It's already been unboxed, which wasn't too difficult considering the quality of the packing. Uh, and now we're going to actually look at that data plate. But first of all, I'm going to put on a little bit more music while we're looking at that strange looking guy. Uh, he's gone. So we just played, you thought I was probably joking. We just played Tubby. So now the next one sounds like it is from an era where it was anti, very anti-war. And the saying was, make love, not war. So that's the name of this song, Make Love, Not War. <clears throat> All right, let's look at that data plate. But before we do that, we'll look in the back of the machine. So, surprisingly, not as dirty as I would have expected. And that cleated belt that's in here 
It actually looks Yeah, that pleated belt looks like it's in really good shape. I didn't try pressing our reverse. Our reverse is real sluggish right now. And you can see we have a cam A. Let me zoom in on it for you. And for me, since I'm looking through a little screen. It's actually cam A1. Some of the, some of the cams have Letters and numbers. Letters and numbers. You can see Husqvarna, Sweden. Wouldn't you love to have been able to be in the factory when they were making these? Kind of like that Singer video that I posted that takes place in Scotland and we're able to see all the different production phases. Wouldn't it have been fun to be in one of the Husqvarna factories? Boy, that would be a hoot. That would be a hoot! Well, there you got her. Husqvarna CI, or some say CL, because the CICL, from what Hans and I have been able to discover, stands for class, class 21A. Class 21A. And you can see it's 110, 120 volts, AC, DC, and the motor size is right over here. 1,5, which is 1.5 amps. And we talked about the origin of Husqvarna Company. There's that incredible crest right there. Yep, very cool, very cool. And we've got our switch right back here uh, for our light and our plug-in point for the uh, foot controller. And you can see this particular one has a blade style plug-in. Some of, some of them have a peg style plug-in like John's that we just looked at uh, through that unboxing. So they were made both ways. They were made both ways. And on John's machine you may have seen that over time this, this gets very fragile and degrades and it basically, basically just disintegrates. So I had to replace this on John's machine as well because it creates a nice buffer so that if that cord is pulled, it's not going to stress those wires that are connected to the real tiny little brass uh, copper type screws that are inside of there. Uh, it's going to create a little bit of a buffer for that pull factor that in inevitably is going to happen. So, This thread guide appears to be uh, in good shape. And believe it or not, I've actually gotten messages. You're going to laugh at this, but I'm, I'm dead serious. I've actually gotten messages from folks that are having sewing issues. The thread is not feeding properly. And if I've got the time, I don't always do it because I just don't have the time. But I'll help them diagnose issues sometimes. I've done this recently for folks. And I actually have a lady right now that is beginning to step into the space of trying to do restorations and repairs on machines. Uh, and... Uh, She's contacted me a couple times for some help on things, and you know, I, I don't I don't always have time, and I don't always have the the, the uh, inclination to do that, but sometimes I do. My whole point is showing this uh, thread guide is that it is possible to have it installed backwards. In other words, see how this opening right here is towards the front of the machine. Spent a lot of time on the phone with somebody one time. I believe they were from they were from Canada. And they were having a lot of thread feed issues. The thread kept breaking. And we checked everything else, kind of diagnosed it. And eventually I said, send me a picture of the top of your machine near the faceplate. And sure enough, this was flipped around so that the opening was on this side instead of being towards the front of the machine. And she had come up with some sort of a fangled way of putting the thread through there when it came and then kind of coming around and over. And that's why it wasn't working. So always check what's obvious, kind of like when you, when you have an appliance and it's not working, make sure you have it plugged in. But in this case, make sure that that thread guide with the opening is facing to the front. And then it's the, it's the same thing on this side, although you can't really see it with it all damaged. The thread guide is also facing towards the front as well when it's not 
bent over like that. Ugh. It could have been pre could have been prevented by adequate packing. There's so many things that can be protected if you treat the machine with the respect that it deserves. So apart from the thread guy being damaged and a couple of uh, blemishes on the extension bed, which I should be able to, again, it's not going to affect the sewing, but the aesthetics of the machine, I should be able to address that. This is going to be a phenomenal machine that I can offer to one of the customers that has inquired about a Swedish beauty. And again, when I when I prepare a machine like this, I go through those 126 steps. I go through the, in, the complete finalization process for the customer. The machine comes with a limited lifetime warranty, which means if you don't abuse it or neglect it, for as long as you own that machine, I've got your back. And uh, when it comes to uh, the machine, you're also going to get three cams with it, typically an ABC cam. You're going to get this uh, extension bed. You're obviously going to get a foot controller. And then you're also going to get uh, a case that the machine can go in as well. So if you're going to go to a quilting retreat or quilting expo or whatever, where you want to show it off to all the girls or guys and just make them drool about your Swedish beauty. Because this is a machine that will make the average person that even doesn't care about sewing. I've had people that contact me that don't even give a hoot about sewing. And they go, that is the most sexy, gorgeous machine that I have ever seen in all of my life. And you can tell in comparison to John's, remember I showed you that wear mark on his where the it was clear coat was rubbed all the way down to bare metal? This machine has not gotten very much use at all. Not much use. So this will be quite a treasure for somebody to scoop up. Definitely a treasure to scoop up. Yeah. All right, so let's do this. I'm gonna go back on the tripod. And I'm going to put on a little bit more music while I get this set up so we can test the motor, etc. Make sure that she's going to fire up. Otherwise, Alejandro and I will be having a conversation not only about his packing method, which is questionable, but also other things as well. So hopefully, hopefully that doesn't have to occur because I get really passionate about sewing machines, if you know what I mean. All right, so a little bit more reggae music. We just we just played make love make love not war, and now we're gonna do earthbound earthbound reggae earthbound reggae. Ooh, this is fun. All right, let's get this Swedish beauty plugged in. And I'm not seeing any signs. I I, I won't do this if I see any signs of uh, fraying on the cords or other warning signs that there may be an issue. So I'm pretty confident that we're in a solid position to do this. But just in case, what do they say? Better safe than sorry, right? All right, we'll plug it in first. Test the light. And then we will test the other things on this machine as well. All right, here we go. Let's see if we get a light come on. Oh, that's right. They, they moved it to some of these where the switch is in here, but on this one, it's on the rear of the machine. And I am guessing, it's only a guess, I'm guessing by how bright or lack of brightness there is right now, that that's probably an incandescent bulb. Yep, incandescent. So before it gets too hot, let me take it out. So this is the bulb we have in here right now. Let me go fetch one of my LED bulbs and we'll see what difference it makes. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
can you not dance to this music? I mean, seriously. All right, here we go. <laughs> That's a lighting system. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Or wait, wait, I'm sorry. This is reggae, calypso style music, not yeah, baby. Yaman, yeah, Yaman, yeah, Yaman. Yeah, uh huh. It almost sounds like I'm saying Yemen, which, believe it or not, when I look at the stats and the analytics, we have lots of folks that watch this channel in Yemen, too. Honest to God, we do. Saudi Arabia, all of those great countries out that way. All right, so the light works, and boy, does it kick out light now. Yeah, that's a little bit of a difference. A little bit of a difference. This is a gorgeous Swedish beauty. Someone's going someone's gonna to scoop this up real quick. And I do, and I don't mention this all the time, and I should, but I do, because of the investment level of buying a Swedish beauty, when you're talking about, I mean, it's, it's the whole package. You're getting this machine that's been fully restored. I've taken it through a 126 process step. Wait, switch that, reverse that. I've taken it through a 126-step process, and it's coming with the extension bed. It's coming with the classic Husqvarna foot controller. It's coming with a carrying case. It's coming with the three cams, which are in and of themselves like gold. Those black cams are gold when it comes to these machines. So if you get a machine with the three cams, walk tall. Walk tall because that is, that's a big deal. But... Uh, because of the investment level on a machine like this, because it's one of the most expensive machines that I sell, you know, apart from maybe like a Featherweight 222K, uh, I offer a layaway plan. And that's where a customer can, instead of footing the bill, all of it up front, they can put a deposit down, which will secure that machine for them so that it's off the block, the chopping block as far as being sold. No one else can claim it. No one else can try to buy it. And then they have up to four months, 120 days. They have up to four months to pay off the balance. And uh, then the machine, after the balance is paid in full, is shipped to them. Lots of folks use that. A lot of folks use that because it takes the stress off of their budget. It gives them an option to have a, a dream machine like this Swedish Beauty, but it doesn't have to give them a sock in the gutter or you know, basically put extra stress on their, uh, their budget that they don't need. We have enough stress in our lives, don't we? And with this coronavirus and everything else, we all have had added stressors. Maybe it's because you're working at home now and you've got to manage the kids and you've got to teach classes because the schools are closed and all the other stuff. You don't need the added stress of wanting to have a, a dream machine like this and have it hit your budget too hard. So up to four months to pay off the balance, a small deposit to, uh, to basically secure that machine with your name and then... Once it's paid off in full, it gets packed up a lot better than Alejandro did and gets shipped right to your door. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about getting a machine like this instead of going to eBay, Etsy, Facebook Marketplace, and you're rolling the dice on what is the condition of that machine going to be? What's not going to be working on it? What has been checked? What hasn't been checked? You know take that stress out of your life too and just go with a machine from the workshop and then put it on the layaway plan and uh and that way you've got the best of all worlds you get a world-class machine that's been gone through from bob and the balance wheel through a 126 step process and, and when that machine is unpacked once you get it unpacked it's quite a process any of you that have received my machines once you get it unpacked which is an hour and a half after you started probably you can sit down to a machine where it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna purr. It's going to just run at the top of its game from the get-go. And then with basic maintenance, it's gonna do that for a lifetime. So there you go. There's my shameless plug. Nothing against the folks that are trying to sell machines on Facebook or Etsy or eBay or any of those other places, but uh you really are rolling the dice, especially with a machine like this that happens to require some very, very specialized servicing. And most of those people selling those machines in those different venues, they don't even know what a bobbin is or a balance wheel, let alone what to do to get that machine at an optimal level and check all those critical points on the machine that can 
create a disaster for that machine in failing on you. So don't, don't even go down that road. Don't go down the road. Don't go down the road. All right, you get the message. Okay, so let's plug the foot controller in now. The light obviously works. And we'll see what we get, if anything, as far as response from the machine when we plug in the foot controller. And remember the one that I got, the, uh, it actually it's now the giveaway for the major contest, which, by the way, I should mention that as well right now. The major contest is underway, and it ends this month, October 27th at midnight, Central Standard Time. We only have one entry as of the showing and as of this live premiere. Only one entry. You can't have a contest with one entry. You just can't. And I believe it's Mary Klein uh, that has, has submitted an entry. Remember, she's the one that won my 1885 Singer 12K that was given away for that contest based on Bill O'Rourke's Neck of the Woods down in Kissimmee, Florida. She's submitted another entry for this contest, which is, is awesome. It's awesome. But she's the only entry. So if midnight on the 27th of October... Central Standard Time comes and goes and she's the only entry. She's written a beautiful piece, I'm sure. But it's going to be for naught. Because I believe that Hans, and Hans can clarify this, but I believe that Hans and I agreed that the minimum number of entries to have a contest, a credible contest, is three entries. So right now we're two entries short of having a contest for the major giveaway for us hitting the milestone of 9,000 subscribers. 9,000 subscribers! And we're almost halfway towards the next milestone of hitting 10,000 subscribers now. Almost halfway. So, if you sleep at the wheel, in a sense, and you go, well, okay, I'm going to enter this contest because I, I would love to win that really rare Type 8E that even Hans over in Norway, right next door to Sweden, said, these machines are incredibly rare over here, even near the country of origin. Guess what? That machine I'm giving away, that Type 8E, is ultra rare. It's ultra rare uh, in the U.S. Incredibly rare in the U.S. You know, if, you, if you're near the country of origin and you can't find a machine there, and the machine was made there? <laughs> what, what can I say? I'm giving away a machine that you can't even find over near Sweden where the machine was made. And you sure as heck can't find them very often in the U.S. A Type 8E, which also on that pulley system, this pulley system right here, instead of having a V-style belt, it's got that cogged belt, which really, really bites into those pulleys that are also cogged so your positive traction and your launch with a type 8e even compared to this machine right here this 21a is just off the charts so not only am i giving away a machine that is rare by every every measure of of the equation uh i'm also giving away a machine that has even a i think an improved drive system between the motor and that bobbin winding assembly where you sometimes will get slippage as that uh, V-style belt starts to get glazed or if it's not adjusted properly you'll start to get slippage when you launch. Uh, on that Type 8E that I'm giving away for the contest that's going on right now you don't have that problem because it's a cogged uh, pulley system with a cogged belt and it just bites into that uh, beautifully. So. So if, if you are following or even knew that we're having that major contest and you want to jump into the game, I mean, Hans does a beautiful job of explaining what the contest is, what you need to do to win. Uh, it's just a matter of taking the time to submit uh, a writing that meets all of those requirements. And you could, you know, you could win a gorgeous Swedish beauty similar to this, but one that's even more rare than this the Type 8E. So, just a reminder, the 27th of October is coming up real quick. Mary Klein, as of the last time I checked, is the only submission. We need two more submissions to make this a contest. 
and then someone's going to win that fabulous machine. So it's up to you guys. You want to sit in the, you know, sit on the fence. If you want to not step out of the shadows and not make a submission, your call. I'll keep my machine if we don't have a contest because I love the machine. It's fabulous and it's very rare. So you guys want to take that machine away from me? You got to submit. You got to meet the requirements that Hans outlined in that premiere announcing this contest. So if you haven't seen that contest announcing premiere yet that Hans we Hans and I are chatting. He's in Norway, I'm in the US and he goes over it in great detail and I ask clarifying questions just to make sure everyone is on the same sheet of music and everyone is set up for success. So that contest is going to end in just a couple of weeks. So up to you. It's your court. Your court. All right. So we've got the foot controller plugged in, fire extinguisher is in place. Let's see what happens. Feed dogs are engaged, motors engaged, so we should get uh, feed dog and material movement as well when we press this down. And hopefully no smoke, sparks, or flames. Hopefully. Oh, I see why it's moving. See how slow it's moving? Look at this. It's because I have the stitch length right now on 0.5. If I adjust it all the way up to 4, yeah, that's better. And now we're going to sew in reverse, or try to sew in reverse. Zoom in on that a little bit more because we're way, 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 way out. So I'm hearing a little bit, of, a little bit of a metallic sound coming from the raceway, but apart from that, it sounds pretty doggone good. Here we go again. And again, never run a machine with the uh, presser foot down unless there's a buffer in between uh, the presser foot and the feed dogs because otherwise and I've said this multiple times as well but again we have new folks watching these all the time and attending these premieres that have never attended a premiere yet about a Husqvarna Viking so I'll say it again even though it's being repeated again and again and again uh, if you don't have a buffer like this material right here between that presser foot and the feed dogs and you're just running it with the presser foot down against those feed dogs you're gonna scar the bottom of that presser foot and you're gonna potentially dull those feed dogs as well. So you're going to cause significant damage by the simple act of trying to operate the machine like that. Press your foot down against the feed dogs. Never, ever, ever, ever do that. Always have uh, a buffer in between so that there's a cushion of protection between the presser foot and the feed dogs. So all in all, not a bad sounding machine coming into the workshop. So now we're going to try another function. Remember me talking about that slow gear that you can activate by pulling that bobbin assembly out? The bobbin winding assembly on the right side of the machine. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I want you to listen to the machine and I want you to also look at the needle movement as I push the foot controller down to nearly full power. So you ready for it? Assuming it works. I, I don't know if it does. I haven't checked it yet, obviously. So. I don't think it works. Let's see here. Well, that's odd. We got movement. We have a light. But now all of a sudden the machine has gone silent. Smelling the foot controller, I may have had a capacitor or a reducer go out on this. Or a motor is possible as well. And that's part of the reason that we have this process 
of testing these machines. I'm going to grab another foot controller real quick and just see if we can eliminate the possibility that it's the foot controller or it's the motor. Hopefully I've got another compatible foot controller in here so we can test it. Yeah, this this will work. So it's not the foot controller, because this foot controller I've used on another machine just recently, and I'm not getting any response. No response at all. So we may have just had a motor spontaneously go out, which occasionally does happen. Check one other foot controller. And this one is also compatible. So we might have a motor that just took a dump. Let me check. Yep. So something failed on Something failed on the motor just during that simple test. And I will try shutting the machine off for a little bit and then try turning it back on again. I should also check my circuit as well just to make sure that I didn't kick something out. All right, so we shut it off. Let's try turning it back on to see if maybe that would somehow. Nothing. So I've got to do some diagnosing now. The motor worked initially, and now the motor is not working. And the balance wheel is turning. Ah, I think I might have a hunch. You see how it try, tried to just kick back in? We've got a motor brush well issue because it was not completing that electrical cycle. Now watch what happens because I manually turned the balance wheel. Let me widen this shot. I manually turned that balance wheel and if you ever get that sometimes it can be an indication of a motor brush or motor brush well issue where it's not completing that electrical cycle uh, properly. So we were getting no response. Now, no response again. See? But now we're going to manually turn that balance wheel with the foot controller down. I've got the foot controller down right now. I'm going to leave the slow gear on so I have a little bit more reaction time. And now I'm going to turn that balance wheel because there's an issue within that uh, motor brush well and I'm going to try to complete that circuit manually. Well, it started to kick kick back in before, so that's gonna that's gonna require more attention. I'll take that motor apart, but it did start to kick back in, so it's an electrical field issue. It's an electrical field issue uh, as far as it not re-engaging. Yeah, it's not completing the electrical cycle. It could be that the, uh, the uh, spring on the motor brush is not applying enough pressure down to make that circuit complete and it's having incidental contact. Sounds odd, but actually by moving the machine, you can even uh, cause that motor brush to kick back in. But not in this case. Not in this case. 
All right. Well, that's okay. I will fix it. See that? Started to kick back in. Yeah, that's an unhappy motor. That's an unhappy motor. But she's in the right place. Let's try that slow gear. If it's if it's going to work, I don't know if it will or not. No. Well, this is okay. You can see that uh, sometimes, even when you're very careful in... Uh, vetting a customer and again it did work initially but there can be until until I go through that machine and check everything thoroughly with my process uh, see that All right, we'll call it quits there. We'll call it quits there. But you get the idea. Um, we eliminated the possibility that it was a uh, foot controller issue by switching to two other foot controllers I knew uh, were working and um, narrowed it down to the motor. So that's where I'll focus. I'll narrow it down to the motor and I should say the wiring as well. I'll check the wiring also. But. Uh, Beautiful machine. It's going to be a fabulous Swedish beauty after I take it through my process. And uh, she is going to get the job done uh, for somebody that's fortunate enough to get her. And again, whether they buy it outright so they can get it right away or whether they buy it through the layaway plan, uh, this machine is just going to be phenomenal. So, all right. Well, that ends the unboxing for this Swedish beauty that I acquired from Oregon from Alejandro who, if he watches this, will never, ever hopefully ship another machine to me in a crummy box like that designed for toilet paper or some other material that doesn't need much protection. And, uh, and this uh, CI-21A, Class 21A, uh, after I get done taking it through my finalization process and I know that it's running perfectly, it will be available for sale, either to one of you that have reached out to express an interest or to anyone else that gets to me first. So there you go. Reach out uh, as soon as you can and say, I want that machine. Otherwise, someone else is going to get their mitts on it. And these things are hard to find, especially one as gorgeous as this uh, and one that will be running absolutely perf to perfection uh, when I get done with it. Blah, blah. My tongue is tying again. All right. Well, this ends the class. All of you get an A, except for Alejandro. And uh, stay tuned for other great premieres like this. And I just, someone just shared a cool quote with me, and I love quotations. So I will see if I can share it with you real quick. And it's, uh, I think it's spot on. And it actually, if I remember correctly, it came from an animated picture. Uh, Kung Fu Panda. If any of you have kids or grandkids and you've ever seen that movie, Kung Fu Panda, the master, the wise master says something that I think is really profound. He says, yesterday is history, tomorrow a mystery, but today is a gift, and that's why we call it the present. So I hope you're making the most of your gift of today. God bless. Take care.